Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the latest edition from Compere's series of webinars. And this time we are focusing on the yearly review of wealth management. And I'd like at this point to thank our sponsors, so Avalok and Creologics, for their continued support in running these webinars. And we certainly are in unusual times at the moment with the COVID-19 outbreak not only causing substantial market volatility, but also resulting in significant changes to working cultures as firms have embraced the, the work from home mentality. And so over the next hour, we will review the performance of the UK wealth management industry, both before and during the pandemic, drawing out some of the positives to arise from it and highlighting some of the records broken by the industry in 2019. And later, we'll also be joined by a panel of CEOs who will share their first-hand experience of running a wealth management firm in the environment we currently live. Now you should see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button. So if later you have any questions for the panel, please do use this and I'll look to get as many of these questions answered as possible. But before we um, start with the presentations, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to Compare for those of you in the audience who may be seeing our research for the first time. So over the past 25 years, we've developed an in-depth database of business performance statistics for the UK wealth management industry. And this allows us to run benchmarking surveys on an annual, quarterly and monthly basis. And over this time, we've also run a remuneration survey. And this is solely dedicated to UK wealth managers and it's collecting data as at the end of May and November. And today we've now got information on over 10,000 employees. So approaching approximately a third of the industry. And we also produce multiple bespoke research projects, and this can be on any topic related to wealth management. And um, one such example of these is the research we do with panels of affluent and high net worth investors, as well as PFAs. And then each year we publish the UK wealth management industry report, and this covers all the latest trends in the industry, and some of which I'll be sharing in my presentation later. And the full report will actually be available in the next couple of weeks. And finally, as we're always looking to expand our products to support the firms as much as possible, our latest launch is on the real charges in wealth management, where we collected the charges for 40 of the largest firms. The next slide, please. And I mentioned that we've got the benchmarking survey, and that's going to be the key source of data, not only for today, but it's for most of our research. And currently we're tracking 162 firms. We focus purely on their private client business, so we stripped out any institutional results. And so to be included, a firm requires only a minimum of £50 million of investable assets. And in the case of wealth managers, they also need to have permission to provide discretionary services, thereby excluding the IFA community. And looking at the firm types, uh, the first group is the executionary stockbrokers, so those offering trading services without the provision of, of advice. And from this year onwards as well, I've actually merged the, the next two firm types. So we've got the full service wealth managers and investment managers. And I merged them because they're now actually offering very similar services with a mixture of discretionary advisory, financial planning, and in some cases, dealing services. And last, but by no means least, we have the, the private banks who are offering wealth management services alongside the more traditional banking services. But be, before I um, share our latest findings, I'm delighted to welcome our guest speaker, which is Chris Terrell from Avalok, and he's going to be taking a forward look and approach for the industry with his presentation on Does Every Cloud Have a Silver Lining? Over to you, Chris. Thanks very much, James. Good afternoon, everybody. As James said, my name is Chris Terrell, and I work for the company Avalok, based in the UK. For those who don't know, Avalok is a supplier of systems that support wealth and investment management, plus private banking from the digital front end all the way through to the back office books and records. The title of my presentation is Does Every Cloud Have a Silver Lining? And Dave, if you could go to the next slide. I'm going to be talking very specifically about the COVID lockdown cloud and what problems has that caused. One can obviously see the impedance on communications between firms and their clients, but also communications between different people within a firm. Digitalization, therefore, has taken a sort of hockey stick curve in its utilization through this uh, lockdown period. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, but if we look at the types of digitalization that exist, we've got obviously firm websites, which is the firm's uh, shop window, where they show off what they've got to offer. Uh, what's evolved over the last few years is uh, what we refer to as a full service digital wealth platform. This is interactive where clients can take a look through their preferred device at the uh, position of their um, portfolios, the performance of their portfolios, other data areas that firms want to present to these clients and to prospective clients. Um, as well as allowing um, clients to actually do things like place trade orders. Now, this isn't in full service terms, just client and firm communication, because a lot of the systems available in the market today now also allow relationship managers and advisors who are out on the road, or shall we say used to be out on the road, going to see their clients and prospective clients and wanting to look at data related to that client prior to the meeting, during the meeting or post that meeting. So very much the full service digital wealth platform is, is the current vogue. But the other area which is greatly emerging at the moment is the utilization of instant messaging channels and applications, things like WhatsApp, for a factor called conversational wealth. If you could take me to the next slide, Dave. Thanks. Some statistics that are quite interesting. On a monthly active user basis, WhatsApp has around 2 billion, Facebook 1.3, and WeChat 1.17. And WhatsApp have stated that they've had a 51% increase in the usage of WhatsApp during the COVID lockdown. And that isn't just social chit chat, more people wanting to exchange views on the latest football match that didn't happen. It's also people wanting to do business using those channels and more and more organize, more and more industry types are taking advantage of these conversational channels. So next slide, please. Let's take a look at where digitalization has evolved from. Way back when, when in the 60s, there were ATMs. They were the first digital way of doing money things, uh, the hole in the wall. That's evolved through telephone banking, through online banking, mobile banking, and more recently, back in 2017, the kickoff of what was called conversational banking. Next slide, please. Conversational banking has quite logically evolved out to include conversational wealth. Now, this is where messaging applications like WhatsApp, WeChat, Line, etc., are used to carry out wealth management activities. It tends to be linked with AI powered chat, chatbots, to enable and support efficient communication. Um, but also because the person to person is always going to be of value. Some of, the, some of the, the, the softwares that support this environment or firms that offer this to their clients will also include person to person, firm to client for digital chat, but also using the phone for what it was made for, voice communications. But all of this without access to data is just a different type of communication without any data research and uh, pertinent information linked. So the logic is to integrate this environment with the application of firms have that look after the CRM to understand what the clients are all about, but also the portfolio management systems and other systems that are relevant to a client's wealth management activity. And what Accenture suggest is that this is moving us into a more social messaging era, which is taking over the wealth management and banking sectors. Pretty powerful statement. They suggest that messaging is now the preferred customer touch point. Let's have the next slide and look at where we're going with digitalization and picking up on a PwC paper a couple of years ago, Sink or Swim. They talked about the fact that lots of, lots of industries had improved the area of digitalization quite significantly, in particular in the banking world, retail banking, but wealth management had fallen way behind the curve. And the concern was whether there was going to be a sink or swim factor with such firms. What they suggest is that firms that aren't swimming on the crest of that digital wave could have their clients poached by firms that are swimming on the crest. Next slide, please. 
they go on to say in a different part of their website, all of this is available through their website, that the impact of digital voice assistance chatbots uh, and on the customer relationship model in financial services could be as transformational as the advent of smartphones a decade ago. And the potential to improve customer experience is even greater. So they pose the question, how quickly can your business really get onto the voice era? Next slide, please. So digitalization, messaging channels, is that the iGen and the millennials only? I'm a baby boomer. <laughs> I'm using digital channels, not just for social chit chat, but also for business activities. I'm using digitalization significantly with my banking, with my wealth management, because it's the way that works most efficiently. So is it just the iGen and millennials? Next slide, please. If you think that it is, here's a little factor that is quite relevant. Most studies suggest that 80% of heirs look for new wealth managers. From that, you can be sure a large percentage do actually transfer their wealth to a new manager. Next slide, please. So where do they move it? If they're the younger generation, the 25 to 50, 40 year olds, then the chances are they're looking on the internet to find out where to go. And they're picking firms that interact and work with them in the way that they like to work. And if that is messaging channels, then very definitely, they're going to favor a firm that's gonna work in the way they enjoy working. Next slide, please. So, why is digitalization, conversational wealth, et cetera, increasing? Very, very simply, firms want to retain, and I emphasize retain, and grow their client base and their business. And at the same time, investors increasingly want to be kept informed of what's going on with their wealth. Even if they're discretionary, they still like to know, are they richer this week than they were last week? And they like often to get more involved, to understand what's going on to a greater level and even get involved, involved in an advisory type relationship where they can make the final decision as to where their investments go. Next slide, please. So the ease, familiarity and effectiveness of communication between firms and clients significantly benefits both parties. Now I've deliberately used triangles because it's a tripartite situation. You've got firms, you've got investors, next slide please, and you've got competition. And as PwC suggests, there are always some nice sharks looking to poach your clients from you. And if they're swimming on the crest of a digital wave, they might be more attractive than your own communication channels. Next slide, please. So where is digitalization going? We looked earlier where it came from. Logically, it's following the involvement of technology because it's not gonna happen without technology. But where the technology is evolving in response to demand from firms and clients, example, improved communications, then that's an adoption of technology which is absolutely guaranteed to take place. And the new environment of communication channels as new ones become available, you can be sure they're going to be utilized. And if by other firms, why not wealth management firms as well? And as Accenture, I suggested, said earlier, suggested, we're moving into a more social messaging era, which is taking over the wealth management and banking sectors. I have another slide. But what about security, I hear you say. Well, you can't talk about digital technologies, messaging applications, et cetera, without referencing security because it's crucially important. And technology providers like ourselves and others in the market today are very, very mindful of that. So we are ensuring that we're keeping up with the new security trends and ensuring that they're linked to the application softwares that we deliver to our organization, to the firms using our softwares. So things like antivirus, firewalls, multi-factor authentication, biometrics, encryption and let's not forget compliance controls they're essential you can't afford not to be adhering to those next slide please so 
back to my question, not the big question, does every cloud have a silver lining, but very specifically, does the COVID cloud have a silver lining? Next slide. Well, I'd like to suggest that if the increasing usage of digitalization and digital channels that's being encouraged by the COVID lockdown cloud does continue and increase, next slide, then this could be a very, very silver lining for everybody. The win, win, win classic scenario. Next slide. That in fact is the end of my slide. So I'll be handing back to uh, Richard in a moment. But whilst there won't be opportunity within this session for me to directly answer any questions that you have, if you do have questions, don't hesitate to get in touch. My email and phone number are on the screen. With that, let me hand back to James and thank you very kindly. I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Well, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, I very much hope that the industry can use uh, some of the, embrace some of the digital services and help you drive some future business growth. But um, let's now take a look at uh, how the industry was positioned prior to the lockdown and what's happened in the early stages of this year. And the um, majority of the data I'm going to be sharing has been taken from our annual survey. So it's covering data up until the end of 2019. But um, where possible, I've also included some Q1 2020 results, which are based on a group of firms which are providing us with quarterly data. So if we could move to my first slide, please. Well, it's always good to start with some positive news. So here we're taking a look at total investment assets managed or administered by firms. And prior to a dip in the final quarter of 2018, the industry actually threatened to pass the one trillion mark then, but it couldn't quite get over the line. However, as resilient as ever, the industry bounced back almost immediately in 2019 and it surged past the 1 trillion mark and in fact finished with 1.05 trillion come the end of the year. And so represented year on year growth of over 100 billion pounds or 11%. And this sort of level of growth was seen by all, all firm types. So we've got the combination of full service wealth managers and investment managers, they're up by 8%. Private banks are up 11%. And exo stockbrokers were in fact the star performers and they rose by a very credible 17%. And understandably, with what we've seen in the markets, those records were short lived. Um, however, the UK wealth management industry is renowned for its resilience. And so the impact on asset values was actually less than some may have expected. So we had the FTSE 100 falling by over 30% in the space of a month. And many will assume that therefore the asset levels would have taken us a similar hit. But with the firms taking a more cautious approach to investments and not being fully invested in equities, and something I'll show in more detail later, the wealth managers actually restricted the fall in assets in Q1 to an average of 13%. And for exo stockbrokers, it did drop by a bit more, so it was at 16%, and they do have a greater exposure to equities, but still somewhere short of what we saw in the FTSE. Therefore, we have the industry assets as at the end of Q1 at close to 910 billion. And yes, it is still a substantial drop and it is the lowest it's been for three years. But then again, we've actually since then seen some good recovery in the markets in the second quarter. And so there's every possibility when we publish the June results that we'll be back to close to the one trillion mark. Next slide, please. So driving the growth in recent years has been discretionary services and whether they take the form of bespoke portfolio management or the more standardized MPS services, they are proven popular both among the investors and the firms themselves, with generally better margins being achieved from, from these services. So many firms are actively encouraging their advisory and non-managed clients to move into discretionary. And so in 2019 alone, the discretionary assets grew by 57 billion. And by comparison, the non-managed assets, who also expanded at a good rate, rose by 37 billion. And this, these non-managed are not only the XO stockbrokers, but also the non-managed services within wealth management firms. But the story is far more discouraging when you analyze the advisor, advisory managed assets. And so at 128 billion, it was only 7 billion higher than you saw in 2018, and only 15 billion higher than four years prior to that. And also these assets have then taken the greatest hit in the first quarter of 2020, and they actually fell by more than 20%. And therefore it's wiped out any growth that we saw in these assets over the past five years. 
Next slide, please. So here we now um, take a look at some of the, the flows of assets. And it, it, I'm only focusing on the wealth managers, so I've stripped out the EXO stockbrokers for this analysis. And from these figures, you can see a very consistent, consistent level of inflows. So just over the 100 billion mark for each of the past three years. And these inflows have mainly been sourced from the IFA community. However, they also include movement between firms and sometimes voluntarily and other times as a result of mergers and acquisitions. But then I'd like to observe the, the outflows where you can actually see a steady increase over the years. And this to me actually suggests that clients are becoming increasingly more willing to switch providers. And then you have the, the high impact of market movement. And it shows the, the, very much the value in delivering good investment performance. Uh, so for example, in 2019, over 70% of the growth achieved by wealth managers was actually down to market growth. And the next slide, please. So to finish my section on assets, I've got a breakdown of the asset classes over the year, so over the uh, past five years. And in previous years, we've seen a steady move away from direct securities. And by that, I mainly mean uh, individual equities and into collectives. And in 2019, there was actually very little change year on year in the percentages with asset values across each of the classes rising by similar rates. But it's in 2020 that I expect to see quite a significant change. And we know that both firms and individual investors have moved much larger proportions of their assets into cash. And this is now expected to be close to the 10% mark. And I would expect to see a further drop in direct securities and a rise in collectives with potentially collectives overtaking direct securities for the first time. Next slide, please. So I'm going to now move on to revenues. And once again, the results were very good for the industry. And in 2019, we had a total of 7.28 billion pounds earned, and which becomes the latest entry in the record books and represents a 3% year on year increase. And across all three, uh, all three firm groups, Revenues were at an all-time high, with once again the EXO stockbrokers topping the growth charts, rising by a very respectable 7.5%, and outpacing the 3.3% and 2.7% increases achieved by private banks and full-service wealth managers and investment managers, respectively. And the results have also been encouraging so far in 2020. So although naturally there's been pressure on fees, we have seen, which obviously are attached to the asset values, we have seen a good rise in trade volumes, and that's even among the wealth managers. And so it's resulted in an increase in transactional based revenues, such as commissions, which have almost compensated entirely for the drop in fees, and therefore allowed total revenue to remain relatively flat quarter on quarter. If we could move on, please. And here we now see the top three revenue streams for each of the firm types, and this is the 2000, 2019 data. And for EXO stockbrokers, we have custody and admin fees remaining as the main source of revenue and actually pulling away from the more traditional income from dealing commissions. However, based on a surge in volumes that we've seen in the first half of 2020, this gap is very much likely to close. And interestingly, actually, the treasury income, and by this it's a mixture of net interest income and FX margin, was actually the fastest growing revenue stream for these firms. And that trend has also continued into 2020 with firms benefiting um, from this income stream as the cash holdings in portfolios increases. Then for the full service and um, investment management firms, the investment management fees is naturally the driving force and, and that they rose on the back of the asset growth in the year. Whereas commissions reduced year on year, but as mentioned before, these are picked up nicely in 2020. And then in third place, we have wealth planning fees. And we were actually expecting much faster growth in this income stream as firms started to move these services in-house. However, the growth was relatively subdued in 2019. And so it may be a few more years until this becomes really a, a core service for the majority of wealth managers. And finally, for the private banks, we have almost all of the revenue growth was from investment management fees with treasury income in particular being very stable year on year. But it, it's always encouraging to see growth in revenues, but how does this now stack up against the asset growth? And so what revenue return are firms achieving? The next slide is. 
Well, for discretionary service, the answer is very much they are the return is being less and less over the years. And so through increased competition, greater transparency and growth in more standardized services with the lower charges associated with them, over the past five years, we have seen a gradual reduction in the return on discretionary assets, dropping from an average of 77 basis points in 2015 to 71 basis points in 2019. And the trend is not too dissimilar for the advisory managed services. However, there does, it comes a point when they simply cannot go down any further and still be a viable service for firms to offer. And I believe we are at that point for advisory. And if anything, I'm sure firms would actually wish these to increase because at these low rates and the high efforts involved with providing these services, it's, by no, it's no surprise that many firms are actually stepping away from these types of agreements. Next slide. Now, a couple of times I mentioned about the rising trade volumes and now wanted to provide some evidence of this. And the largest source of trading comes from the XO investors. And so here in the blue bars, we see the total number of XO trades over the years. And then in red, we've got out of those, how many were in collectives? And so that's the purchases and sales of unit trusts and OICs. And essentially, total volume has been actually relatively stable over the past five years and it's averaging approximately 18 million trades a year. But we have seen a nice pickup in collective trades, which has compensated for any reduction in equity trades in the UK markets. However, what I wanted to focus most on in this slide was actually the bar at the very top. So at first glance, it may look as if volumes have suddenly dropped. However, I must point out this bar represents the total number of trades in just the first three months of 2020. So in co compared to the equivalent quarter in 2019, trade volumes have more than doubled. And we also believe that the volumes have continued to be very high in Q2 as there continues to be the high market volatility. So therefore we could reach close to between 16 and 18 billion of trades in just the first six months alone. And so it's almost certain that we're going to have by far a record year when the 2020 year is completed. Therefore, there is one certain positive result coming from today's environment, and that is the business it is generating for the execution only stockbrokers. On to the next slide, please. So here we now see that the revenue generated from each of these trades, and with the blue line being total revenue per trade, so that's a combination of includes all fees, commissions, interest and dividing that by the total number of trades. And then we have the red line, which is only focusing on the commission per trade. And what we've seen is the gap between these lines has slowly been widening over the years, and with commissions reducing due to the high level of competition and an increase in collective trading, which for some firms, actually, there's no commissions attached to them at all. And whereas in particular, if you look between 2016 and 2019, there was a sharp rise in admin fees, which meant that total revenue per trade increased quite significantly. However, when I add in the, uh, the Q1 2020 results at the end of the chart, we suddenly see a sharp drop off in the total revenue per trade. And that just shows the sheer impact of a dramatic rise in volume in the period when asset values and those fees linked to those values have fallen. And this may look like bad news for the exo sector, but even at £14 less revenue per trade, the increase in volume has been to such an extent that the exo firms are actually better off. Next slide. Well, so far in my presentation, the results have been largely very positive. Uh, we've seen strong asset growth, strong revenue growth, and especially in 2019. However, from here on, I'm going to start to show some of the issues that have been arising for the industry. And first and foremost, we have the rising costs that the industry continues to face. So year after year, we see costs increase at a very similar rate to revenues. And so margins have been relatively flat or if anything squeezed and proof of this is to come in one of my latest slides. But in 2019, for example, costs increased by 4% to a rather unwanted record of 5.49 billion, and which was actually higher than the 3% rise in revenues we previously saw. But now I ask, where are these cost increases occurring? And I'll show them on my next slide, please. And here we have the, the breakdown of cost by department, and it's all taken as a proportion of total costs. And so these include both staff and non-staff costs associated with each of these departments. And the key thing to take from this chart is to um, note how similar the 2019 and 2018 values are 
when you compare it to two, when you compare the two years, which implies that actually the cost increases have been across across the entire business. And so there's no individual department that firms really need to focus on to gain a, a better control on their costs going forward. But the only notable changes really in cost percentages were front of support costs for the wealth managers. So we saw a reduction in these as a proportion of total costs and that's possibly as a result of some efficiency improvements with some firms embracing more digital services. And then for the exo stockbrokers, the main change was really a drop in their marketing costs and whilst that was compensated for by a rise in the dealing and operations costs. And speaking of operations costs, if we can now please move on to the next slide. And this slide charts the, the total expenditure, and that's across all firms on IT and operations, and it includes all staff costs, non-staff costs, and any outsourcing or group, group transfer charges relating to either IT services or operational services such as settlement, custody, and accounting. And in both cases, we see that the costs in 2019 were at an all-time high. And I believe that these cost lines will continue to grow for the foreseeable future as wealth managers start to catch up with other industries and embrace more and more digital services. Uh, but these costs should, however, be worthwhile. And I believe that there should be multiple efficiency gains on the back of them. And we've actually started to see some of this as if you take each of these values as a percentage of revenue for operations costs, it's been very consistent over the five years. So it's been 6.5 or 6.6% .6 each year. Whereas for IT, cheers percentage of revenue, it's reduced from 10.9% in 2015 to 10.4% in 2019. On to the next slide. And Carrying on the analysis of costs, these tables show the non-staff costs for wealth managers and for excess stockbrokers and taking them as a percentage of revenue in each of the past two years and then calculating the year-on-year -year growth for 2019 versus 2018. For excess stockbrokers, well, the standout result is a near 10% reduction in marketing costs. And however, in the current environment, the business actually appears to naturally be coming to these firms both from existing and new clients. And so one might understand why less marketing may be required. However, I always encourage firms to continue to market the services as it is going to remain a highly competitive industry. And it's so easy to open an XO account in a matter of minutes that those who do not market their services may be missing out on a substantial inflow of clients. Whereas for wealth managers, there was actually a surprising reduction in operations non-staff costs and we have seen in the previous slide that total ops costs were rising. So that, that implies that these rises mainly came from increases in operational staff numbers and also um, higher outsourced and group transfer charges in this area. But going forward, the main change I would predict is a reduction in premises and facilities costs. And it is, happens to be the second largest non-staff cost line currently. And so we speak with firms. We, they are now far more open to the idea of staff working from home, and that's even after lockdown. And so there's going to be far fewer staff in the office as well as a result of the social distancing requirements. So I wouldn't be surprised to see some firms reducing their office space if given the opportunity to do so. On to the next slide, please. But although the, the office space may reduce, there's little indication to suggest that the number of staff is going to reduce as well, and they'll simply be based elsewhere. And in 2019, the total staff employed by the sector, both directly and indirectly through other parts of groups or, or from outsourcing providers, increased in total by 425. And that was almost the exact reversal of what we saw the previous year. And private banks tend to have the, the largest fluctuations in staff numbers with substantial cuts in 2018, followed by staff recruitment in 2019. Whereas for full service wealth managers and investment managers, the number of staff actually continues to rise over this period as it has done in each of the last five years. Then for the EXO stockbrokers, there was what seems to be a rare, albeit small, reduction in staff in 2019. And so I'm now going to take a deeper look at the past two years to see in which roles the staff numbers have varied. And so next slide, please. Well, Across most of the roles, we didn't see an increase in numbers in 2019, 
were typically close to inflationary rises in the average staff costs. And the largest increase in number was, been, was in other product specialists, and that's predominantly financial planners, and also in compliance. However, in both cases, the average staff costs increases were in fact, very small or even reduced, which suggests that many of these staff being brought in are more junior than they were before, and so actually bringing down the average staff costs a bit. Another area that firms have been boosting is corporate staff, and with the, they also haven't had the largest average staff cost increases in these roles. Some firms have brought in new faces, whilst others have re rewarded existing management staff on the back of strong business growth. Then uh, at the, the top we see the, the front office staff costs, and they continue to be at the core of firms' cost bases, with average staff costs well in excess of 100,000 for each of the, the five roles at the top of the table. So one would therefore hope that the productivity of these staff has been strong to warrant these pay packages. And on to the next slide, please. Well, there's some good news, and actually um, the productivity has been consistently rising, but I believe there's still substantial room for further improvements. So in this chart, we first got the, the blue line is showing the average number of managed accounts per front office professional. And so this increased by four in 2019 to 161. And the, the value of assets from these accounts rose to 71 million, so from the, the red, red line, and that's also on a per FOP basis. And as such, then the revenue generated on a per FOP basis, which is in the green bar, has also increased to just under half a million pounds. However, the reason I feel that these can be increased substantially is prior to lockdown, I believe there's much time being spent on traveling in between client meetings or going to see prospective new clients, whereas lockdown may however work as a catalyst, as um, Chris mentioned, for a greater number of uh, virtual meetings. And so there's gonna be no travel time associated with them. And so combining this with improvements and more automation from internal systems, we hopefully will see that front office professionals will be able to take on more clients, thereby raising the, the value of their client books and generating more revenue for the firm. And the next slide, please. So to, to finish my presentation, I've just got a few more slides on profitability and scalability. Now here we've got the, the average pre-tax profit margins for each of the firm types since 2015. And for exo stockbrokers, it actually paints a very healthy picture. So we've got margins rising to an average of 46.3%. However, I really need to point out these these are weighted averages, and at, in the case of the XO stockbrokers in particular, have been skewed by a couple of the larger, very successful players in the industry, which, and the skewing effect I'll show a bit later. But for um, private banks, the margin steadily increased and for between 2015 and 2018, but there was a slight squeeze in 2019, finishing on 25.2%. But my biggest concern is for the full service wealth managers and investment managers. So this is the largest group of firms. So uh, at the start, we mentioned there's 122 firms in this group. But for the fourth consecutive year, they reported a reduction in average margins. And given this was uh, in a period of good asset growth and good revenue growth, it brings out the question uh, that are many of these firms actually set up to be scalable? And also, as I touched upon, uh, being, these being weighted averages, um, we'll see that there is significant variation from one firm to the next. And I'll show this now on the next slide, please. So although EXO stockbrokers have the highest average margin, they also have by far the largest proportion of firms that are loss making. That's 44% of them in that bracket. This therefore suggests that execution only dealing, it can be a very lucrative business but at the same time, it's far from easy to get to that position. For the full service wealth managers and the investment managers, there was a relatively even spread across the margin brackets with the largest cluster in the 10 to 20% mark, which ties in with the, the average margin that we saw on the previous slide of 18.6%. And finally, for the private banks, there is a good proportion of firms in what I class as the healthy bracket, but earning profit margins are between 20 and 40%. However, there are still 50% of firms that are, are either loss making or with margins of less than 10%. And so the, the health of this sector may not be as good as first thought. And so this then opens the door for more mergers and acquisitions to take place in the coming years, 
the firm's likely to target some of these low profit firms that may be willing to sell. On to the next slide, please. And so to, to finish my presentation, I just wanted to take a, a closer look at scalability of firms in recent times. Um, by our definition, uh, a firm is scalable for that year if they are profitable and in a given year both revenue and profit margin increases. So here we show the proportion of firms that I would deem as scalable in each of the past five years. And they're, they're split by firm type again. So execution only stockbrokers, they had the highest proportion of scalable firms based on 2019 results, but at 38%, that is, this is still a relatively low number. Then for full service wealth managers and investment managers, they continue to see the proportion of scalable firms reduce year on year, but still come in second place for 2019 at 27%. And in 2018, 2017 and 2018, it looked like private banks had really turned a corner. We had over half of them reporting scalable results, but then that value has dropped quite significantly in 2019 to just 21%. Now, to, to put a further dampener on these results, out of all 162 firms that we reviewed, only one of them could I class as certainly scalable, which achieved scalable results in each of the, these five years. And then if value increases to only, only slightly to 13, if I actually take into account those which were scalable in four out of the five years. And what makes this even worse, if we take a contrasting figure, there were 30 firms which failed to achieve a scalable year in any of the five years. And so they're either consistently loss making or every time they generated some revenue growth, their profit margin actually reduced. So scalability is certainly a significant issue within the industry and one that I hope can be rectified in the near future. Well, that uh, concludes my presentation and I hope you found it useful and please note we will be sharing the slides after this webinar so you do not need to find any means to memorize each of the figures I've provided with you today. Um, but so I'm going to now move on to our final session which with this webinar which is the panel session and so I am delighted now to welcome our panel members where we have Sarah Saw from Foxmore Investment Management, Ben Snee from LGT Vestra and David Joyce from Creologix. I think a great way to start the um, panel is if each of our panel members could um, just give a brief introduction to themselves and the, the firms that they work for. And if we start with Sarah, please. Hi, yes. Um, thank you very much, James. Uh, I'm Sarah Saw, CEO of Hawksmoor, uh, an investment management and fund management company headquartered in Exeter in the southwest and in London. And Ben now, please. Oh, ben, now, I believe you need to unmute yourself. There we go. Um, hello all, my name is Ben Snee. I'm the CEO of LGT Vestra. We are a full service UK-based wealth manager. We started the business um, about 10, 12 years ago, 2008, and it's grown to about 15 billion of, of assets and 350 staff. Um, about half of our clients are private clients and the other half are IFAs and other intermediaries. Thank you, Ben. And, and David? Thank you, James. Yeah, I'm David Joyce. I'm the CEO of Creologix here in the UK. Uh, we are a, um, a software product supplier focusing exclusively on the system of engagement, i.e. the front end and the user experience. Great. Um, well, let's uh, kick off with the, the questions. So the first one, I'll um, start with you, David. So it's becoming a bit of a cliche to say that things are never going to be the same after COVID-19. But can you point to some examples of specific things that you feel will be permanent? And um, are there any counter examples of things you actually expect to return to the old norm? Um, well, I, I think it, it's pr probably a cliche to answer uh, with this, which is, um, I think what it's what what the the, the current crisis has demonstrated um, is it's really amplified and accelerated um, firms' uh, view of uh, what they need to do in the digital space. And in fact, you know that's that's been exemplified by um, how we've had to react uh, as an industry um, with remote working um, and the speed with which that's happened. Um, I was talking yesterday and. Uh, and one of the, the, the people uh, on the call said that, that um, 
in a non-COVID situation, it probably would have taken two years and, and X number of board meetings and committees and, and what have you um, to move staff from working from home to work, from working in the office to working from home. And all of that happens in two weeks. Um, so I think um, uh, it's, it's shown us that, that uh, it, things can be done um, quickly and in an agile way. Um, I think that's brought with it. Uh, one of the things that changed is um, anytime access. So there is a heightened expectation, I think, from, from clients uh, that they can uh, now reach and talk to their relationship manager and investment manager, uh, not just in a, a standard um, slot of time. Um, that, that now has been extended. And I guess that with that comes a, a kind of a care warning in terms of how do we deal with that um, as we come out of lockdown. And I suppose the final thing I would, would say is, um, in terms of, of uh, what we need to look out for, um, I think cybersecurity, uh, th this, this whole um, situation has highlighted the need to double down uh, on uh, the security side of things. I think we've seen that with firms like Zoom, um, who have had to, uh, to look long and hard at their fitness for purpose, um, given that they've become an overnight uh, name and success story. Thank you, David. Ben, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the cliche of um, flexible working um, becoming, I guess, much more widely used is true. It has been impressive how quickly people have been able to adapt, and we're very proud of the people in our business that helped us to do that. We actually conducted a, a survey um, to all of our staff and asked them how they're getting on at home and whether they would like to bring back some of the flexibility to the, the office-based environment. And there was an overwhelming response. Over 80% of people said they wanted to work from home. So, you know, we're, we're planning on, um, you know, on doing that and having probably around about 30% of people working from home going forward, obviously using video conferencing and, and, and remote IT. Um, you know, but, but as David says, it is forced digitalization. It's not the CEO who's doing it, it's not the COO who's doing it, it's COVID-19 who's, who's pushed us down that road, which I think is gonna have long lasting and hopefully pretty positive benefits. Um, you know, we're using electronic signatures, all the paper-based processes are pretty much gone. And also, I guess another positive, it's reducing our sort of carbon footprint. We normally print around 210,000 sheets of A4 paper every month, and we're down to just over 2,000 now, so a 99% reduction in paper, um, less commuting, it's better for people's home lives. So, yeah, there, there will be some, some permanent effects of, um, of COVID-19, and I think some, some quite positive ones. Thank you, Ben. Sarah, is it, you're in a similar situation? Well, very, very similar situation. Um, uh, I, I think, and I'm certainly sensing over the last uh, uh, three months, there was a sort of a, a, a huge enjoyment about being at home. We have got one or two staff who are now quite keen to get back into the office. And I think there are certain situations which do actually warrant face-to-face -face rather than, um, in fact, we were saying in the run-up to this call that actually... <laughs> It's quite nice going to conferences and meeting people. The downside to um, doing uh, your review uh, online, well, the, the upside is that you can get a lot more people seeing it. The downside is you can't interact so easily with, with everybody in the in audience afterwards. So I think things like that, um, we still will probably, as human beings, graduate towards each other in more social environments. I think things like board meetings and, and key large meetings probably better done face to face than than on a zoom um, and I think some client entertainment you know it, again we're, we're going to be hosting a webinar for our IFAs and, and for our private clients um, which is great because we can reach out to those clients who wouldn't normally be able to access that sort of um, event but again the face to face um, sort of uh, entertainment side I think we we as human beings will want to, to return to that side of things. Thank you, Sarah. Um, now, one of the other issues that I really brought out in my presentation is the issue with scalability. And so, starting with you, Sarah, do you believe that um, your firm has a scalable model? And what are the main hurdles that you're going to have to um, overcome to achieve both growth in AUM revenues whilst improving your profit margins at the same time? Well, I was I was rather pleased to see that your um, 
your criteria was increasing revenue and increasing pro uh, pre-tax profit margin, which we achieved both of those in 2019. So, uh, um, so I, on, on that basis, yes. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I think scalability uh, comes down to efficiency. And I think as an industry, we can be a whole heap more efficient. I think we've managed to achieve that in the last three months, thanks to, to COVID-19. But it is about uh, declunking the processes. And, um, and I think with the same uh, number of staff, you can um, scale and reach out um, quite quickly. And, and that acceleration that we've demonstrated to ourselves um, as an industry can, can, can only continue. Great. And how about you, Ben? Would you class LGT Vestra as scalable? Well, I'm, I'm biased, but I would. Um, and I think we probably <laughs> hit the, the targets as well. Um, yeah, I mean, our business is split sort of 50% intermediaries and IFAs, and that, and particularly the platform, the MPS type models are very scalable for us, um, but sort of platform driven. Although there's a physical limitation or challenge in um, building links to the to the different platforms and, and automating it as much as possible because you still have to do reconciliations and and that sort of thing. So there are challenges, but that's that's very scalable um, for us. But the core business, yes. Um, and as Sarah said, it, ultimately it comes down to investing in technology and embracing it and being progressive. But um, there's a limit, I think for relationship managers or investment managers in terms of their physical time that they, they have to spend to properly service a, 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 you know, a client relationship that's a decent size. So I think um, you know, the, the sort of um, robo advisors or cyborg is probably more likely, a, a obviously better for the mass affluent market insofar as you've got high net worth and ultra high net worth clients. It's harder to scale because it's about the physical relationship. You've got to make sure your processes are are up to speed and invest in it and um, and do that, but but then there'll be a, there'll be a limit, but but it still can be very profitable and you can resist margin erosion. If you don't invest in in making things more efficient, then you, I think that our, our, our sector people in it that don't do that will be left behind quite quickly with the, the margin erosion. Okay, um, now you mentioned about the um, briefly the, the robo advisors. So um, to what extent do you believe that established wealth management firms are actually going to fear competition from some of these digital challenges? So you've got the robo-advisors, you've got the digital specialists and the, um, the retail banking world. Um, as I say, I, I'm not sure that they need to, it depends on the client segment. You know, if you're, if you're going for mass market, um, lower end clients, I think probably there's going to be you know, more um, challenge on, on servicing people using technology as a pure play rather than the sort of um, um, traditional face-to-face -face method. But, but the cyborg approach of, of mixing the two um, is where it will, it will hopefully gather a bit of momentum and that will be on, on, you know, moving into the high net worth space for the much larger clients. I think it'll still be a human-based um, relationship and you want very, Good execution for the service you're providing, but it'll be a human-based um, service. Okay, David, what are your thoughts in this area? Well, I, I suppose uh, I'd echo a lot of, of what Ben has said, um, and I suppose we're in a slightly different position in that we are a, a business that is is looking to serve businesses such as Ben's and, and Sarah's and the other and, and the wealth management community. But I do I do think that a hybrid model. Um, is, is certainly uh, the, what is, we're going to see as the way forward. I think we've been through Robo 1.0 um, and that has had a, a very mixed um, uh, result and that, I guess that's being generous. Um, so I think a hybrid model uh, is very much um, the way forward. I, I think there's a lot to learn as well um, for all of us if, if we look at um, some of the, the new entrants into the, into the wealth management space. Uh, I don't see them as, as people that are coming to eat uh, the, the lunch of, 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 our, of us and, and, and our clients, but I do think there's a lot to learn there in terms of how they're using technology uh, to support their business model and where they're using it to differentiate um, and to enable new ways and, and new, uh, new, new ways of engaging with their customers, as well as using technology as a way to create scale efficiency 
um, through you know, deployment to the cloud and what have you. So I think on the, there are two aspects to it. On the front end, hybrid approach, mixing good digital engagement um, with, with human interaction, but also on the back end, using it as a way to um, create efficiencies uh, within the business. Um, Thank you, David. And Sarah? Well, I, I would sort of pick up on two, two things here. One, which was what Chris mentioned um, in his presentation, was how the younger generation want to uh, converse with us. So we um, really need to think about the yeah, as you know, we're, we're, we're keen to get the, the children and the grandchildren of our clients, but it, that's going to be a very different way that we interact with them than, than we, we do with our, our existing clients now. But, uh, and the other point that I would make is, is that um, robo advisors were, were all created during a, a bull market. And um, I should think a heck of a lot of clients of robo advisors in March were absolutely panicking because they're not experienced investors and they didn't have access to a human being to go, do I sell? Do I buy more? What do I do? So it, it's back to David's point. It's the hybrid um, between the two that will, will take us forward. And, and those firms that can achieve that will be the ones that su will succeed, in my opinion. Thank you, Sarah. Um, now, moving on to a question on charges. Now, we've seen uh, from the, the impact of uh, market crashes that uh, obviously it's naturally causes asset values to reduce quite significantly. And a lot of um, charges now are based on a percentage of AUM. And so do you think we need to potentially move away from percentage fee charging? And for example, in a recent survey we did with some investors, um, they found that for financial planning, a large proportion actually wanted to pay on a fixed fee basis. So do you think this could be applied to other wealth management services to, so that we're not as greatly impacted by extreme market volatility that we've seen? And Sarah, if you could start, please. Yes. Um... I would be delighted. It reminds me, I don't know how many people who were on this who uh, know Simon Locke, who uh, set up Hartwood. Um, and he, at least five years ago, if not longer, was, was completely campaigning for fixed fee for, for our industry. And um, uh, I, I think it is certainly a, a way forward and, and to be charged on the size of the portfolio uh, in relation to the amount of work done um, versus uh, an ad valorem fee has to be merit in looking at it. There's no doubt about it. And uh, Ben, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, a fixed fee is a very good way to charge, but there are sort of issues with, with it. I mean, if it's not embraced by the whole industry, um, in spite of Mifid, so it's very difficult to compare apples with apples. And it requires a bit of a re-education of clients to to do that um, and to some extent there's a sort of alignment of interest with a, a fee-based model sorry an asset-based model because there's a, there's a strong incentive to achieve good investment returns and if the performance is good the fees are higher and vice versa but I think if you have a sort of fairly tiered very clearly communicated AUM basis for charging with possibly you know caps in place for the for the very large clients uh, and, and, and sensible tiering that that's I think that's a pretty good way to charge. Um, so I completely understand the merits of, of, of a fee. I, I came from that background of PwC when I started, but they, they found that hard to scale, partly because clients writing a physical check in pounds and pence, no matter which way you, you, you cut it, is slightly more painful for them. Um, and if you're competing against people who don't do that, it's, you know, it's, it's difficult. So it needs to be embraced, I think, widely, maybe, maybe even more regulatory pressure, I don't know. Um, but I think, you know, a fairly tiered AUM basis is still good and fair for the client. And uh, David, just to add um, a little question we've got from the, um, our audience as well about charges, where it's asking them, has the squeeze in margins actually been um, possibly a result of wealth management firms having to be more, more realistic with their charges and were potentially expensive to start with? And so how would you, what comment would you make on that? And also, do you believe um, that wealth managers need to adjust their charging structures? Well, I'll, I'll bow to the, to the expertise of, of, um, of, of, uh, of Ben and, and Sarah uh, to, to a large degree on all of this. But I suppose from, 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 a, from a, uh, looking in on uh, the industry, I think that um, uh, to echo Sarah's point, I think moving to a, a fixed fee 
um, uh, is certainly something which um, I think is attractive. And you'll see, you know, I think we've all seen some of the, you know, some of the newer entrants and some of the incumbents uh, moving uh, to that. Um, and I think it's it's also about about making clear what service you're getting. Right? So you know, if you move it to kind of like more of a kind of a subscription type model, and and you couple that with some investment commentary and education, then I think you can you can probably charge um, uh, a fixed fee, but a premium fixed fee for, for that type of approach. Um, and I suppose you also need need to look at um, the, the kind of the segmentation of, of, of your book, right? So. I, uh, I think probably a fixed fee model, maybe for the mass affluent uh, side of things, um, where people are perhaps more used to, to buying that kind of service on a fixed fee uh, basis. But I think I'd probably echo much of what's been said around this question and, and, and some of the previous ones, which is for the higher net worth um, individuals, um, then uh, that, that probably isn't appropriate. Uh, and I think that's probably where a kind of a more ad valorem based approach uh, would be well received. Thank you, David. Um, so going back to the theme of technology, and would, would you actually agree that technology spending in wealth management is too often associated with just IT costs? And so how can firms take a more proactive stance on innovative technology and uh, growth investments, for example? So, David. Um, so I suppose the short answer to the question is yes, I would. Uh, I suppose I would uh, um, agree that that uh, it's too easy, or, or not. Perhaps that's the wrong term. I think the IT costs are all it's it's all lumped together, and I think we need to make the differentiation between um, back office and and client facing IT, um, and the IT that is is that firms have just to manage their desktop environment. But, but it was interesting looking at the figures, James, that, that you, you put forward earlier on, um, you know, because I think, you know, the front, front office costs uh, were, uh, front office personnel costs was around 45% and the IT costs were around 7%. And that seems massively out of, out of skew. And I suppose to be perhaps provocative, you know, if you were to make a small adjustment um, and, uh, take some of the, the, the cost from the front office, maybe five to 7% and put it onto IT, that would have a massive impact in terms of the, the IT spend available to, to, um, to clients. And, and I think it's you know, back to what we were talking about at the top of the call, there is no going back now. Um, I think the, 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 the digital journey, if, if firms weren't already on it, are now on it. And, and I think looking at that technology spend and looking at how it breaks down and making sure that you've got a, a, a clear breakdown of, is this making me more efficient? How is this enabling me to win or retain new business? How is this differentiating me from my competition? I think that's, I think a valid KPI and, and something that, that, that firms should be looking uh, to, to, to review and track um, uh, going forward. And so, Sarah though, is, would you share that view? I mean, do you, for example, yeah technology across multiple departments rather than just yeah. IT. Yeah, completely. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that, you know, most, some firms, I wouldn't say all firms, had a, a sort of resistance to arming their investment managers with laptops and iPads and stuff. And, you know, you had sort of one to share per team and, oh God, you couldn't arm every, anybody with an iPad, everybody with an iPad. And now suddenly everybody's got laptops and iPads because that's the way forward and that's what we're using now. So uh, yeah, we, we've got to give everybody the right technology um, to make them as, as efficient as possible. And, you know, and to Ben's point that relationship managers um, and investment managers who are managing money and looking after client relationships, they have a certain bandwidth and the more technology they've got to <laughs> to um, uh, deliver what they need to deliver on that bandwidth is, is going to help them um, immeasurably. And Ben, is there anything to add? I agree with, with all of those comments. I, I mean, I think it's, um, it's not just about spending money on IT, which I think there's a difference between business as usual IT and then spend on more progressive technological improvement. Um, and the latter is, is what drives the change and you have to invest into talent to do that. It's not cheap, um, but you need progressive thinking and you, and you have to have dedicated project management resource because trying to do it 
the analogy that we always use, which I'm sure, sure people have, have used before, but is it's trying to put a, a horse shoe on a galloping horse. You know, if you're trying to change and you're also running all the, and you don't have dedicated resource for it, it's very difficult. So um, for us, we, we found that you need dedicated resource. You have to invest uh, and, and make and sort of ring fence that from business as usual. So it's how you spend the money that's key. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm just going to do one more question, being conscious of the time now. So I've had one from the, our audience, which is saying, um, what are expectations around training and compliance? So do you expect staff to still sit their exams in traditional examination rooms or are you expecting far more online training content and uh, assessments for RDR compliance, et cetera? So if we start with you, Ben, how are you expecting training and compliance world to change given the current environment? Well, I think it's, it's an absolute natural progression that, um, that it'll move online. There's no reason for people to trace, you know, to different parts of the country or London, sit in a, in a, in a room uh, where you might catch something, let alone COVID, um, when you can do it from your, your PC. I mean, it's the way the whole world is going. And um, there's a lot of online learning. I've had my two children homeschooling and we've, we've seen that. And it's, I mean, it's actually been pretty impressive. Um, and, the, and there's no way that that won't proliferate across you know all, all sectors including you know ours and the, and the compliance side of things and training i think it makes complete sense again sarah what's your yeah. view on it? I, I would i would completely echo that um it, it, it is the way forward and in fact we've been um training some of our investment managers not on compliance stuff but on um on other training during lockdown and it, it's a perfect opportunity and you know doing a zoom call with a trainer and you've got nine people in a group it's a darn sight easier to get than get nine people in a room in an in an office everybody can agree to get to or get away from their desks etc so it, it it's a perfect uh, uh, way and actually does disturbs less the productivity um because you're not moving physically to go go somewhere to be trained or as, as Ben says, to go into a, an exam hall somewhere where you can pick up something not so good. Thank you. And David, obviously you're from the software supplier, but um, obviously you've got to train your staff still. So it's very much more based on that front. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, it, it, you know, it's all been said really. I, I think um, there's been a progression to online learning, hasn't there anyway, uh, over many years. Um, and I think whether it's for compliance, whether it's for continuing professional development, um, uh, providing it online where staff can access it uh, at any time of the day or night, uh, any day of the week, um, uh, it, it is, a, is, is the way forward. It's the, it's the progressive model. Um, in fact, we, we have a, a, a part of our business, um, our group business is actually providing online training. So, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, that we are very, very familiar with. Fantastic. Well, um, I think I'll, I'll naturally um, bring uh, this panel session to a close. So thank you very much, uh, David, Ben and Sarah, for your time and your very detailed answers. I'd also like to, um, again, thank our, our sponsors. So CareerLogix, not just because I speak to David as we speak, but um, Avalok as well. And um, thank you all for all our participants today. So um, thank you very much for listening. And I hope you enjoyed webinar we will be sharing the slides and a recording of it afterwards and um, apologies for anyone whose questions I wasn't able to get answered today I'll, I'll look to answer those following the webinar but thank you once again and I hope you all have a lovely evening